for melodic heavy metal. Playing it heavier. Louder. Raunchier. Faster. This is the Signals of Intuition. There's brand new Echo Temple right there, that from their new album, Angels and Shadows, that song was Epsilon. You're listening to The Signals of Intuition, your home for melodic hard rock and heavy metal. And tonight on the show, we've got the singer of that band, Mr. Tom Calandra, who is the singer of Echo Temple, as well as Zlot Z, a uh, Houston band from the 90s who had a sound very similar to Queensryche. He now also sings in a Journey tribute band called Escape out of the Houston area. So let's get Tom on the line right now hey brand hey tom how's it going man i'm good how are you doing well so uh when i like to do these i always like to start at the beginning of you as a musician and then work our way up to uh the new record that you guys have so i guess looking back where did you grow up and how did you get started in music well actually uh i actually grew up not too far from where you are in buffalo new york most of my family still there this day but we actually moved south you know my parents actually moved us i'm gonna say uh, late 70s so i was a uh, i was a young guy 11 12 ish we moved to the south actually to south louisiana so quite a bit of a of a culture shock you know sure parents were looking for better job opportunities so we settled down in lafayette louisiana i think that's when i started high school actually and that's kind of where I really started kind of getting into to rock and roll. I really grew up with idolizing guys like Steve Perry and Lou Graham and Paul Rogers and really kind of got into that classic rock of the 80s, so to speak. Somewhere down the line, metal reached out and grabbed me. Um, bands like Queensryche and Maiden and Dio became some of my bigger idols. So I kind of progressed into that love of metal. That's where a lot of my influences came from as far as my original material, I think. And where then do you start singing? Like, do you have other musical training as well? Or, you know, I mean, I know so many singers who you just happen to have a group of friends and everyone's looking around going, all right, who wants to sing? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was similar to that. You know, um, when you got that passion for music, you know, wherever it is, you start singing in the shower, you're singing in the car along with your favorite songs. It was kind of a, I guess I was kind of a late bloomer. I want to say in my early 20s, I started thinking, man, I could maybe do this. I started doing some self-training with uh, cassette tapes and so forth. I think some of my uh, my college roommates back then would kind of still tease me to this day about hearing all these fa-la-las and scales and stuff that I was singing in my in my room. They're trying to go to bed at night and I'm up practicing type thing. And so, yeah, we kind of, some buddies, you know, kind of had a band put together. Um, actually, my first band was actually out of Lafayette, Louisiana. It was a band called Licks, L-I-X-X. Um, How very 80s. <laughs> yeah. Right? Oh, man, trust me, if you saw some of the pictures back then, it was actually kind of hilarious now looking back, but that's the, the age we lived in, you know, but it was ironic because we dressed, I mean, I can remember putting on the spandex and the fishnet stockings and the, the glitter headbands, but we were playing Judas Priest and Dio and Metal Church and Iron Maiden. So we totally did not look like we sounded. If that makes any sense, it was kind of funny looking back on that. Oh, that's funny. So when then, when do you move from Lafayette to Houston? Or did you move to Houston? I mean, I know you're working with Z Lot Z who are based out of Houston. So how does that sort of next step happen for you? Yeah, that was kind of the next step. So in the late 80s, ironically, I had a, a good friend of mine that moved to the Houston area, wound up getting together with a group called Granite. And he had known of Licks, reached out to me one day and was like, hey, I'm in this band Granite. We actually share the same management company with Hellstar. You know, I think we got a good thing going. We're going to record a record. 
you know, we're going to be rock stars, this type of thing, you know. So back in my, you know, mid 20s, you know, I was working, trying to go to college, but that was kind of difficult because of finances. And so I decided to take that leap and say, hey, you know, I think I'm going to move to the big city and and see what comes of this group. I actually was traveling back and forth between Lafayette and Houston, which is about a three and a half, four hour drive. I can remember borrowing my mom's car and going every weekend and auditioning with Granite and eventually got the gig and decided to move to Houston. So I kind of left my immediate family, moved to Houston and pursued this process with Granite. Obviously, down the road, the thing with Granite didn't work out. We disbanded. A couple of band members moved away and heard about these guys in Z-Lot Z that were looking for a singer early 90s went out auditioned with them and ironically they kind of put me on the spot and we we always I always think back to this day where they were like hey man we're we're working on this new original and wanted to see if maybe you could put some melody or some words to it so I literally sat down on the floor with a notebook pad as they were going through this tune and that's where uh, the road to nowhere was born right there on the spot as I was auditioning for Z-Lot Z so when they saw how quickly I could put some melody and some lyrics together. Um, it was kind of fate, I guess, if you would have it. Sure. And I know that story is in the booklet for the uh, 92 album, too. Yeah. For Licks or Granite, did you guys actually record anything? Is there any recorded stuff from those bands or no? Not really. I mean, as far as Licks goes, it was so, you know, preliminary. We did some, you know... Basement uh, demo or something, eh? Yeah, I kind of put a blank cassette in a boom box and record practice type thing, record some of the live shows. But granted, we actually did record and had a cassette because back then, you know, I'm showing my age, but we didn't really have digital recordings. So we had an analog recording on a cassette. It never really went anywhere, never really got released in any form or fashion. We just kind of have it kind of in our catalog of tunes fun to kind of break out the old cassette player and listen to it every once in a while but um, never really nothing that was that was released officially not till the zlot z days sure so i got a question for you just talking about the 92 album in the album it mentions that there was a song that was taken off the album on the original cassette copy is that true because on the CD, it's got In My Heart supposedly in its place. Um, you know, I can't even remember, to be honest with you, how that unfolded. I do remember that, you know, In My Heart was a song that we had written that we didn't feel like it was uh, stylistically fitting with some of the other songs at the time. But then when we put the record out, we wanted to add that to it. You know, like other bands, I'm sure there's a catalog of songs that we had written that we didn't really think made the cut. It's kind of weird as a musician so close to the action, sometimes you feel like songs are stronger than people that are actually listening to it, you know? So it's kind of a weird dynamic. Yeah, that's the thing. It always shocks you with what people like and what they don't. And, you know, the song to you that you really love and think, oh, that's the single or that's the, you know, the song we should push or whatever, right? And then meanwhile, everyone else is like, no, 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 that's the song on the album. Everyone else likes that one, right? So God knows <laughs> how that works. Exactly. It is a weird dynamic. You know, I guess sometimes it's good, you know, it's good to get that feedback. You know, if, if you've experienced it, it's good to get that feedback from the listeners because you're so close to it and you have a person, you may have a personal favorite or favorites for different reasons than an unbiased listener just going, yeah, man, that's catchy or man, those words really, really hit home with me type thing, you know. Yeah, it's, I, I forget what musician I was listening to an interview with, but a, a fan asked him, when you write a song, is this song purposely you're going to write a hit and then this song is more a B-side? And he's like, what? He's like, I just write songs. He's like, the songs that I've had that are hits, I have no idea. You know, half of them I had no clue that would be the hit. It's like, I always thought this would be. And sure enough, nobody knows that song to this day. So it's funny how that works. That's pretty cool. That just shows the... Uh the creativity, you really don't know where it comes from at all. You just, you hear a melody, you, you put down some words that are inspirational in some sort. I guess that's the beauty of music and, and songwriters, you know? Yeah. Now, I know for uh, the first two Z-Lot Z records, you guys worked with um, the uh, the recording studio that you did it at. Was it Sound Arts? Sound Arts, yeah, in Houston. Still there to, that, to, to this day that I know of. 
Now, was it 92 that you guys did a bunch of just marathon sessions to get the EP done? Yeah, man, tearing at your mind. This, you know, back then, the only way we could afford any type of professional recording was to buy blocks of time. So, you know, we would buy these 12-hour blocks where, okay, today, dudes, you're going in and you're doing your sessions, you're laying down your tracks. When you get close to being done, give me a call so that I can get ready and come down there to do mine. So, yeah, it was kind of these marathon, you know, at least 12-hour sessions. I mean, I could remember... Ironically, looking back now, I can remember the engineer kind of like dozing off on the board and we'd have to like, dude, pat him on the back, dude, let's go take a coffee break, you know, and we'd run down to the corner store and grab a candy bar and some coffee so that we could get, you know, get through the session. So, yeah, it was, I guess you could say it was a marathon. I can remember getting a phone call at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, dude, it's time for you to lay down your tracks. And I'm like, really, dude, it's three o'clock in the morning. Come on, dude, time's wasting, you know. (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> get up, grab a quick shower, jump in the car and drive down there and knock them out, you know? That's crazy. So when you cut vocals, you cut them like for the entire record in one session for those two albums? Basically, you yeah, you basically just stayed there till you were done. You know, we didn't have the luxury of a lot of retakes and you basically had to live. Hey, man, I don't know. That line right there kind of, kind of sounds a little pitchy. Oh, we're just going to have to roll with it, dude. We're running out of time, you know? So... It wasn't it wasn't perfection by any means, but we were able to get through it, you know. No, I mean even still, I mean the strength of those records to this day, especially in the circumstances they were done in, is a testament to the band for sure. You know, especially I mean you think of how almost live in a sense those records were done if they were done that quickly. Oh yeah, man, very very proud of those days, uh, the the bonds and the friendships created over those ten years. You know, we we didn't quite make it. We we just. We were just a couple of years too late. You know, we we got kind of sabotaged by the grunge movement, like a lot of the the melodic metal bands of those days. Uh, I can remember Eric and I going down to to the South by Southwest show in Austin. And back then they had this they kind of had this panel of of judges, if you will. And we we signed up for this one seminar and basically you'd walk in the room representing a band or, a, or an artist and you would basically drop a cassette tape in this box and these guys would go in and they would randomly just pull out a tape stick it in the stereo start you know giving a 30 to 30 second to 60 second listen of the songs and then they would basically say yay or nay or what they like what they didn't like and i remember to this day they they popped our our 92 in there and I want to say I want to say maybe Lonely as the Hunter they gave a quick listen to and then Shelter and instantly they were like oh dude this is like dated 70s art rock not going to work in today's world and me and Eric just look at each other like oh crap we're doomed you know they totally <laughs> hated our stuff cuz they were it was it was the 90s man it was the Nirvana you know and the Green Day day and age and it was just not stylistically going to work as far as what we what we kind of wrote what we kind of wanted to go with so we were just we just missed it by a couple years man i I really think to this day that if we were if somehow we would have been a couple of years earlier on the scene we might have been able to to at least make a pretty decent living doing what we loved you know but we missed it and and there was a reason for that and and only the good lord knows right you know right no, I mean, if I kind of think the same way, not to say you guys were like Queensryche clones, not by any means. I mean, there is some definite influence in there, but there's a lot of other things too. And you guys certainly had your own sound. But I think had you guys hit it and, you know, I think the band started, what, in 89? Somewhere around there, just before you came on board? Later, 80, 89 is, is when I had moved to Houston and it was in Granite. So it might have been, you know, 90-ish, 91-ish, somewhere in the early 90s is when we when we first got things rolling, obviously 92 was the title of the demo, which was the year that we, for the first songs we had written together and, and recorded. Ironically, you mentioned the Queensryche influence. You know, we kind of always go back and when we do talk about it, we actually kind of started this whole tribute band rage, at least down here, because we did Queensryche songs so well, we decided to start a side project, which is still to this day in Houston called Mind Crime, where we did that that tribute to Queensryche. 
And we kind of attribute some of our local regional success to that tribute band mind crime because we would break out and do these queens songs and then in the middle of a live show we'd say hey you know we're actually an original band from houston called z lot z we'd like to play one of our songs for you and we'd play a z lot z song and then you know at the end of the night we would just sell out of cds and merch t-shirts all these people were like wow man you know this is cool so i think we were able to really increase our following to, to Z Lot Z by doing, you know, the mind crime thing. So we owe a lot of success to that. Well, it's funny. I saw mind crime play at Prog Power about 10 years ago and they actually did all of Operation Mind Crime. But I think there was Chris Salinas who was in the band, if I remember right. Yeah, I absolutely. And he does a he does a stellar job. He took over for me when I stepped down. Obviously, when I stepped down from Z Lot Z, I also stepped down from mind crime at the same time and they wanted to continue mind crime on and they they recruited chris out of san antone and uh he's done a stellar job in, in my place and I'm, I'm proud of what they've accomplished um just stepping back in time for a moment you know when it comes to a lot of the zlot z stuff i know one topic you seem to write about a lot is the topic of kids you know in shelter you talk about i think it's child abuse or something along those lines loaded gun it's kind of more of like a school shooting right it's kind of ironic because in 1995 that wasn't you know you think of how huge a topic that is nowadays right. is that something that you just kind of you know were fascinated by or yeah i think i think it goes back to you know most people that know me and, and uh, are close to me know that back then all i ever wanted to be was a dad you know i always wanted to be a dad and just hearing the things in the news even back then were just so troubling and, and you, i mean it's, it's it's almost daily now you know you you hear about the, the tragedies that happen and it's so unfortunate because some of these young people, they never had the ability to to experience things in life that we have. So those inspirations were, were real and from a place of uh, unbelief and tragedy, you know, and oh, yeah, they're huge topics now. And I think they were back then. But, you know, nowadays with social media and the, you know, the way that our local news and, and national news kind of sensationalize everything it's you know we have a computer on our hip all day long and we get access to some of the horrors of life and so tragedies like that just really hit me where it hurts you know and it's kind of what i've written about as a as a songwriter all these years sure now for the next album uh soul existence obviously is a bit of a jump i guess in terms of everything the production stylistically i think you guys forged forward a little bit further even on that album uh, and you worked in a totally different studio this time with a new engineer with uh, Matt Weaver. How, tell me about this whole recording experience and writing and everything else during that period of the band. Well, at that time, quite ironically, back, you know, I mentioned earlier that the early stages of Z-Lot Z, we kind of feel like we kind of missed the boat by a couple of years because the, kind of, the grunge scene kind of was taken over. And ironically, we I think we started kind of getting a little influenced by some of that music that was coming out at that time um i know back then and, and still today i was a huge fan of king's x uh band in alice and chains so you can sense on soul existence how some of the music was a little bit uh tuned down a little more crunchier guitar sound much like the king's x's and the alice and chains and the sound gardens were um, and matt was a musician at the time and he was really all into that style of metal at the time. And so he had a studio and we, we decided to give him a shot because of that. I hate to say new direction, but somewhat of a different sound uh, stylistically um, that we were kind of going for at that time. Yeah. Now, was this one, was this another marathon session album or did you guys get to take your time with that album? I think we got a little bit, I think we got, you know, as I, as I recall, we got a little bit more time to to get things a little better track wise, mixing wise. Obviously, at that time, our guitar player, Greg Gill, had really blossomed into, uh, he was really kind of blossoming as his own producer. I could remember doing some mix down sessions with Greg kind of taking control of some of the producing at the time. So that was kind of some of the individual musicians could kind of take the reins a little bit and kind of produce our own stuff. 
I can remember, you know, a funny story about the, the song I Want Out was a song that was another song inspired by some of the horrors in life. It was the Jeffrey Dahmer situation. And I can remember Greg and I sitting there and we were trying to come up with some cool vocal effects uh, for I Want Out. And we were specifically working on on a delay, on an echo on the I Want Out, out, out. And we were trying to find the perfect delay time in milliseconds. And so we were we were working with this delay that Matt had and we were hitting the button trying to find this random millisecond. And we we hit the random button and it would come in and we were like, wow, I think that's it. And we Greg and I looked over at the display and the the digital display read 666 milliseconds. <laughs> and that dude, that totally freaked us out. Like we 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 were like, dude, it's time to go home. You know, we're haunted or whatever. You know, so Jeffrey Dahmer's haunting us. So that was kind of a thing that I'll always remember till the day I die. You know, that whole 666 with with Jeffrey Dahmer really really was a freaky thing, man. <laughs> Funny. You know, it's kind of neat. I was looking through the booklet for that album and I stumbled upon the special thanks for that. And it just blew my mind because all these bands that like I'm from Canada, but somehow stumbled upon you guys and all these other bands from the area. And I'm looking through and it's like, you know, it mentioned Strangers and Aska, Stride, Mystic Cross. You know, it's just all these, you know, and then, of course, um, obviously King's X, as you mentioned, are from Houston as well. How was the scene around that kind of time? It seemed like melodic metal was doing pretty decently in Houston back then. Oh, man, it was the time of your life, man, where, you know, we still sometimes talk about it today, you know, with the Echo Temple guys, because back then, you know, mid 90s, the clubs were packed no matter who was playing, you know, and the guys that we mentioned became real close friends of ours, the guys in Stride, the guys in Mystic Cross, you know, Aska was a band that we befriended out of the Dallas area because we were doing a lot of shows in Dallas at the time. So meeting and, and hanging out with George and those guys in Aska, but oh you know, yeah, those were those were our closest buddies, you know, the Mr. Cross guys, the Stride guys. We had so much respect for their music. But yeah, the scene was just killer. I mean, it didn't matter who was playing, you knew that if you were going out on a Friday or Saturday in the club scene in Houston, you were always going to go out to a packed house. You always had a good chance of seeing big, huge bands. I mean, back then we had the the blessing, if you will, of being able to share the stage with Tesla and Ronnie James Dio and Ingve Malmsteen, to name a few. And so um, the scene was just as alive as ever to where now it's not so live, you know, unfortunately, and the music scene for original melodic metal is just not live at all in the Houston area. I mean, maybe a month ago, we did our kind of a preliminary CD release party with three or four bands on the bill. We, we could barely draw, you know, 100 people. And it's just the way of the world, you know, the we kind of and I, I hate to blame it on anything because it is what it is. But it's really the the tribute band is the big rage nowadays in the music scene, and I'm in one, so I know. It's funny because I was, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, tell me, tell me about uh, you know you sing with the Journey tribute band right. Escape. Tell me how did you join that and that kind of thing. Well, again, you know, you just mentioned Mystic Cross and you mentioned Stride. One of the I want to say it was it might have been our I don't know if it was the first or the second uh, Z Lot Z reunion show. I want to say it was the second uh, Z Lot Z reunion show. Bass player from Mr. Cross, Bobby Caton, and uh, guitar player from Stride, Joel Gregoire, they had actually started the band Escape many moons ago. And they actually came out to the Z Lot Z reunion show. And after that show, they approached me and they said, Hey, man, um, we're putting together uh, Escape again. And we would really like you to front it if, if you'd be interested, you know. And I had so much respect for Stride singer Gary Beelan at the time. And he was actually fronting Escape at the time. But they had... Well, it's they it's had, funny because he sounds so much like Steve Perry. Like, um, I mean, he, he I, I have the, the Stride album. And I mean, I put that on. It's the first thing. I'm like, oh, my God, this is like heavier journey or something, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, so they had disbanded for a while. 
And, you know, Gary had went his way, Joel and Bobby went theirs and they had, you know, invited me to, to front escape. And so I told him I would talk to my wife about it and think about it a little bit. It didn't take me long, you know, to think about it because I, I actually contacted them the next day and actually signed up for it. But it's kind of weird how that circle of music takes you back because that's kind of where my roots were. You know, I've, I was always a big, huge fan of Journey. Ironically, my wife is probably the biggest Journey fan I've ever met. <laughs> so she was obviously on board with that whole thing. But um, what was so cool about being in a Journey tribute band is that Journey's music transcends generations, right? So you have people that have a primary love of country or pop or rap or metal, and everybody knows and loves Journey. So we're able to play so many different types of venues, you know, weddings, corporate events. We do a lot of um, municipality events like festival type things, uh, July 4th celebrations. And so we're so busy doing shows like that. And it's so cool to reach out to a different genre. And they're actually kind of surprised when I tell them, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm an original metal band too, you know, no kidding. And so it, it opens up other doors, but yeah, it's a fun time. And I'm blessed to be able to play with awesome musicians that ironically were in the same scene that I was in back in the mid late nineties, you know, and with the stride and Mr. Cross guys. Yep. No, that it's funny. Cause a lot of that whole scene, you know, the seventies, eighties, nineties metal scene has kind of moved into that because like you say, that's where the money is today for better or for worse, you know? Absolutely. And it's, it's a shame in a way, in one sense, it's a shame because like I said, this, the Houston population, just doesn't support local music. And I would imagine that that holds true countrywide. I don't know. How is it? That's, it's the same down here. Well, and here, here's the thing, and this is how I always put it, is back then you didn't have... There were only so many things to do on a Friday night. I mean, now it's limitless. I mean, you have an internet connection, the people you can talk to, the things, you know, video games, and just there's... Music is just limitless now with what you can get a hold of. It's like back then, if you wanted to hear bands that weren't on the radio, I mean, you had to go to the clubs to see something new, right? And now it's people just, there's so many other avenues for things to do that you've got to convince them that why would I want to leave my internet connection to go watch some band? I'll just I'll just stream it on Spotify while I do this thing, like, you know. So it's sad, and I think, you know, a lot of the people who still do come out are the ones that still have a passion for it, but I don't think it's quite as culturally ingrained anymore in people to go out on a Friday night to meet people and whatever else, you know? Well, I think, and I think a lot of it too is just the, the natural progression of life, right? So people that grew up listening to melodic metal, whether it was hair metal, whether it was, was you know, Dio, Maiden, Priest, those types of bands, these folks are in their 50s now, late 40s, you know, 50s, even even late 50s, early 60s. Let's face it, when you have a full time career and you have a family to support, you're not typically looking to go out on a Friday night and stay out till one or two in the morning to see bands. You grew up on Def Leppard and you grew up on Maiden. So you want to get your fix. You just open up your phone and like you said, turn on Spotify or turn on YouTube. And there you are. You don't have to go out and stay up late, and it's it's just kind of that that natural prog- natural progression of life where, you know, the kids of today, twenties that are in that party lifestyle, they're typically going out and checking out rap bands and hip hop and stuff like that. Even country, there's a big scene in Houston for for country music, so a lot of the a lot of the young party goers are supporting original country artists but as far as the the melodic rock it just our age group just doesn't go out that much anymore yeah well i was interviewing another singer and he said you know he said nowadays this style of music it's being held it's basically being propped up by a cult (laughs) it's like there's a cult of fans that keep this going but it's like there's not the you know a lot of the outside support that there used to be because it's just not the current popular music as it was in the 80s or you know even early 90s right so it's a generational thing, but yeah. 
So you mentioned this already, but I know around, you know, 2002 or so, you ended up leaving Z Lot Z. And I know at the time the band was at least demoing new material. I've, I've actually got a demo of a song called Dreams and Rainbows from back in the day. Right. Do you know what was going on in the band about that time and what sort of led to you leaving? Well, basically, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that one of my biggest goals in life was to be a dad. So thank God around 2002, my wife was pregnant with my first child. And I was at that time, mid late thirties decided, you know, I gave music my best shot. I don't think it's going to be something that I'm going to be able to make a career out of. And so I think it's time for me to, to step down focus on on a career and uh, focus on raising my son. And so that was the decision behind stepping down. And it wasn't just, you know, hey, I'm tired of Z Lot Z. I'm tired of doing this mind crime thing. You know, I was retiring from the music business. I was stepping away and focusing on being a dad and a, and a good husband. So I stepped down and I, I know at that point in time, they were going to try to continue on And they had uh, some other singers had come in. Eventually, um, they just, you know, nothing really hit home. So eventually they had, you know, disbanded Z Lot Z at that time. I don't remember exactly the date or time, but I want to say it was maybe 2003, 2004. They had uh, decided to just basically fold up Z Lot Z and move on. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I I remember that, you know, reading about the band – you know, just, just kind of everyone gets older and you just move on and such is life. You know, it happened to my own band. So, I mean, that's that's how it goes. But then I know a couple of years later, it, I think it was about 2006 to, I don't know, it would have been probably around there on MySpace. I know a couple demos came up of Lady of the Light and I think it was another song, Snapshots, if I remember right. Yeah, I, yeah that's, that's, that's funny. I didn't even realize that was on there. <laughs> yeah, there, there, it was just like a couple, like maybe one minute clips. Um but uh, yeah, so I, did did you like that was because Greg by this point had you know Diamond Recording he was doing with Bobby Blotzer, right? And I think so was it just him continuing to write music and that kind of thing and called you up and said hey you want to sing on a few demos I've got? Yeah, it was actually it was actually uh, Greg and um, Rick Ward on drums who who was uh, one of Greg's best friends and and uh, had played in Midnight Circus with Greg, and then uh, Joe Morgan on bass, who actually had done some stuff with Z Lot Z and Mind Crime. And we just decided to, you know, Greg was like, hey, we got these songs kind of written. Let's see what we can do with them. So uh, at that time, Greg had a home studio, and it was before the Bobby Blotzer marriage, if you will. And so I remember we had laid down a couple of songs and ironically, they weren't even complete songs. They, you know, to this day, they were never all the way finished. But um, we started working on that and we had thoughts of maybe rebirthing Z Lot Z with the four of us. And then um, a job opportunity opened for Rick and Greg in Missouri. And that was the time where they took their families and moved to Missouri. And that was pretty much, you know, put the Z Lot Z to bed for, for good at that point. I still have those songs on on CD, and I you know I, I break it out every once in a while and listen to it because, you know, like I said, I mean everything that I write, I have a personal connection to. I'm not a big fiction writer. Something has to inspire me, and so those songs, Lady of the Light, where it was stemmed from a dream that I had, and Snapshots was just touching on the different things in life that you just have this photographic memory of that no matter how much older you get, like when we were talking about the Jeffrey Dahmer thing with the 666 on the digital delay, that's a snapshot of life that I can never erase out of my memory. It's just these things you have in life that are just imprinted in your brain that you can never get rid of, whether they're good or bad, you know? But yeah, that was kind of the last of Z Lot Z at that point. Um, all right, so we've talked Z Lot Z and Escape. Let's jump now to your current band you've been doing for about the last 10 years or so, Echo Temple. How did this band come to form? I know in its initial stages, you guys had, uh, I think it was Adam and Shane from Z Lot Z. Correct. Yeah, so back in, like you said, it's been about 10 years now. It's hard to believe that, but around 2009 or so, ironically, a old high school buddy of my wife's 
happened to hit her up on Facebook and was like, hey, you know, I'm putting this band together and I know that your husband used to be in Z Lot Z. Do you think there's ever a chance that he'd be interested in getting together and jamming every once in a while? And so she kind of approached me one day and she was like, you know, you used to be a lot happier when you were when you when you had music in your life. Are you missing it at all? And you think this might be something of interest? You know, my high school buddy, John, is kind of putting together a band, kind of a weekend warrior, get together, jam a few covers type thing. And uh, I was like, I don't know, you know, it's been so long. I don't know if, if I'd still have the chops and all of this stuff. So I decided to go ahead and, and give it a look. So we kind of got together for a couple of jam sessions. He had uh, put out some ads on a local musician eBay type website and sort of a, of a musician ad type thing where you can go and recruit people, you know, band, sell band equipment. Anyway, he had a bass player friend at the time. You know, we had a, we had our, a drummer answer the ad. We basically got together one day over dinner, talked about it and decided to let's learn a few tunes. And turns out that John and, and the drummer that answered our answered the ad was was our current drummer, Chris Kotlars. And so we you know got together, learned a few covers, jammed around a little bit. Well, it turned out that um, John and Chris had this catalog of original material that they had dropped in my lap. And it so, so inspired me and it rebirthed that fire that I had to write original music again. So that's kind of was the was the birthing of Echo Temple. We started writing these songs and we thought they were pretty cool and inspiring. And we decided to to keep on writing it. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the material for the fall that we released back in 2004. Uh, was we had decided, you know, back then, I'm sure you could tell from a lot of the songs, I was just amazed by some of the stories biblically. And those were the inspirations for most of the songs on the fall were some of the stories out of the Bible back in the, in the, you know, especially the first Testament with the wars and the battles and the things that the, that the human people had to had to deal with back in those days. So those, that was a lot of inspiration there. But yeah, the the music that they had written was so inspirational that I had to it's something I had to pursue. And it is to this day, you know, obviously, you know, we talked about the scene being so dead here for original metal. And so I think you talk to to any musician and, and you're one yourself. I think everybody I, I think I could vouch for most musicians you know, you write music for yourself. It's a part of you, especially as a singer. You know, I never had the the ability to, to to play an instrument, so I just played the microphone. So being able to write lyrics was something, you know, every song that I've ever written or recorded, there's some sort of part of me in those songs. Now, whether whether I write them in first person, third person, whether I'm writing them about an event, there it, it touched me in some way. So those songs will, you know, every song I've ever written, whether it be Granite, Z Lot Z, and, and Echo Temple to this day, there's some sort of a tie to something that inspired me somehow. Yeah. Obviously, in the past, you guys have worked with like outside engineers, you know, with Z Lot Z. And now you've got Chris, who's, you know, an engineer in his own right and has uh, engineered the two albums. What's it like working with an inside band member do all that stuff as opposed to someone on the outside? Well, I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to make his head too big and pop, but Chris Codlars is a guy that is unlike any person I've ever met in my life. The the talent that he has, I mean, I don't know if you know his background much, but he started out as a guitar player. So, you know, he's a 30-year amazing guitar player that decided midstream to switch to drums. And so you don't see too many guys in a band anymore that is advertised as the band's drummer that writes, you know, more than 50% of the material on the record. Sure. On guitar. So he is really a major driving force then in, in the uh, whole band then, eh? I mean, he's he's the sole reason that I'm still doing this in Echo Temple because his the music he writes and his creativity and to be able to do that on guitar and play the stellar drums that he plays and he does is able to 
have the ability to record us and produce us and mix and master us. And the vision that he has and the ability that he has is just mind blowing. Yeah, it does wind up sort of being his baby in a sense, even though you all are a part of it too, right? So, well, yeah, I mean, his baby in essence because of his abilities, but he's very open to other influences. And, you know, he's not the kind of guy that writes a song and is like, hey, it's going to be like this. You know, this is how it is and that's it. No, he's very open to changing arrangements or trying new things. So, Everybody from, you know, the original lineup to our current lineup has an influence on the tunes. But it's Chris's songwriting was the inspiration to me, you know, coming back in full blown and giving 100 percent and writing, writing and recording again. But, yeah, everybody has their unique input. And Chris is more than courteous as, as, as far as allowing those ideas in. And we just kind of mold it that way. But the, for the ability that he has to know how to record and get the best out of us as musicians is a unique ability. So he's not just any old band member. I like to think he's kind of the glue that keeps it all together. Sure. So in 20, was it 2014, you guys did the fall. Right. Um, and then you guys just released uh, Angels and Shadows in April of this year. Tell me what sort of happened in the band between that period, because obviously, first of all, it's a big jump of time, but also I know you guys have had a couple member changes as well. Yeah, a couple member changes. Uh, again, you know, um, we weren't doing a lot of shows because there just wasn't really a big scene. We would kind of wait till we had an opportunity to maybe play with a national act that was coming through town. And of course, like I mentioned, you know, uh, everybody is in that upper 40s, early 50s range. So everybody's got careers, families, just that normal domesticated lifestyle. And so time goes by and before you know it, yeah, it, it's even freaky to think about it at this point in time that five years went by between the fall and Angels and Shadows. But but again, um, you know, when you, when you have some member changes that kind of breathes some new life into things, we had changed bass players and that whole thing didn't work out. Uh, John Wisser, who was our original founding member and, and guitar player, he was wanting to, he was more interested in a alternative type metal sound that the rest of us really weren't digging too much. So he decided to branch off and join some other projects that were a little bit more on the alternative metal side of, of our genre, if you will. And so me and Chris and Sean kind of stuck together and Sean and Chris were continuing to write tunes and send them to me. Uh, and I was kind of still writing myself. We decided to get back with Thomas Helton, our original, I wasn't really the original bass player, the bass player that joined after Shane and Adam had uh, stepped out. And then, uh, we just not too long ago recently added Dale Rasco on guitar and Dale is coming into Echo Temple as a very accomplished writer, recording guy himself. So he was able to bring some tunes into Echo Temple that, that he had written and his style and our style meshed perfectly. And so, you know, quite a few of the songs on Angels and Shadows were, were written by Dale and the others written by Sean and Chris. So it was a perfect blend of styles and very inspired by Dale's writing as well. So now we have three guitar players, if you will, in the band, all with amazing abilities to write tunes. And so they have a catalog of songs now that they're ready to, to drop on me for the next Echo Temple record, should that come to fruition, you know? So right now we're just enjoying Angels and Shadows and we're very proud of those songs. And, you know, again, we did it for ourselves and we, and if other people around the world like it, that's just the cherry on top, you know? Sure. Well, it's, it's funny you mentioned having, you know, this new songwriter in the band because I mean, you know, obviously the album has some different songs and it's not just a repeat of the fall, like no band ever completely does. But no, I mean, you listen to that whole album, you'd never know it was different people doing the songs. Like you say, it meshes so well from song to song and it's a style across the whole record, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, unfortunately, I, I'm not all the way up on the newer, you know, metal that's coming out. I still love stuff like Symphony X and, and uh, you know, bands like that. I love... Russell Allen, I love uh, Yorn Alande, 
Um, don't always get a chance to listen to their newest stuff, but you know, Angels and Shadows is a pretty diverse record from a band that's calling themselves, you know, melodic metal. Um, there's a lot of I could point to biggest part of me comes to mind. You listen to that song and if you played that for the average layperson, if you told them that was a metal band that recorded that, they would probably look at you a little funny because it's such, <laughs> such a diverse kind of a song that we're very proud of, you know? So there's a lot of diversity, but yeah, diversity, but, but I think they all kind of blend well. So I appreciate you, you know, pointing that out and, and giving us props on that because sometimes, you know, I can remember in the past, a lot of times diversity could kill a band too. Record companies wanted one style, and that's the style we're going for. And this song is too far off kilter. We're not putting that on the record. Nowadays, we don't care. These are the songs we wrote, and this is what we're going to record. We're not really trying to impress a record company or a, or a manager of any sort. You know what I mean? So it's a little bit different different world yeah no and i th i think that sort of like labels obviously exist and have their influence but like you say it's so changed i mean it's funny i was talking to a musician about a year ago who you know came to me and says oh well i know you know you've done a bunch of records and you've put them out and that kind of thing and should i approach a label should i do demos and send them to labels and that kind of stuff and should i do spotify and should i just make a video or whatever and i i looked at him and said honestly i don't know I said, it has changed so much, even in 15 years since I've been doing this, you know, and it just boggles the mind how much everything has changed. Yeah. I think the smartphone and access to broadband internet has just, it's changed everything. I mean, like so much from in the, in the last 20 years, it's just crazy. And it's like, as a musician, how do you approach that? Where do you look for gigs? And it's like, it's, it, I think it's beyond looking at the label thing, unless you get really, really, really lucky nowadays you know yeah i mean and i don't know you know obviously with my background in bands in classic bands the journeys the foreigners the sticks of the world and then you move into the the metal era you know obviously you still have the big metal bands that can still sell out arenas but um do you have new metal bands in, in our genre that are quote unquote making it big even if they're signed to a label, so many people nowadays, they don't go to a lot of shows. Yeah, they got they got songs on their fingertips. They don't buy whole albums. They stream one song at a time type thing. So I don't know. I mean, you're probably more in tune with it than I would be. Do you have newer up and coming bands that are that are actually making it big in the metal world anymore? Maybe in Europe where they still where it seems like melodic metal still mainstream not so much in the states yeah i mean as far as melodic metal i mean bands still punch through you know there there's always going to be something that sticks but is it going to be the 80s where you know everybody's listening to the new iron maiden i mean probably not i mean there's there that's that's part of the thing too is there's so much diversity um i went to a seminar at sweetwater last year you know, they're, they're kind of like the new musician's friend. I'm not sure if you've heard of that company. Oh, yeah, Sweetwater, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, know my, I know my band guys get, get equipment from them a lot. Yeah. yeah, so every year they have a thing called Gear Fest. And last year they were giving a talk there and they said, you know, in 1980 there was a thousand new albums that came out that year. In 2018 there are a hundred thousand albums that came out this year. Wow. So you think of how hard it is for a band to try and make it but at the same time how great it is for the consumer you know to sit there and go i, I mean any sound you could think of is pretty much there's a band for it or a you know a niche to fill that kind of music now it's it's unreal oh yeah so many different genres have spawned you think of metal i mean there's so many different genres of metal nowadays that you didn't have in the past so yeah i mean and then if you if you even scale it back to rock think about what's considered rock nowadays so yeah i could imagine there's there's so many choices for the average listener now that's why you almost have to just write songs for the love of it you know i think i, I remember hearing hearing an interview was it maybe bad company that said that said dude we just we just wrote songs and wanted to have a good time and and the fact that we made it huge and were able to make a a, a huge living you know, writing and recording and touring was just a, a blessing. You know, 
we weren't trying to write hits. We just write, write cool rock and roll songs and wanted to pick up chicks. You know? <laughs> so it's amazing how, how that works, you know? Yep. No, so that's exactly it. And I think that, I guess, kind of is the theme is you got to do it for the love. And then whatever comes beyond that is brilliant, you know? It's it's icing on the cake at that point. Yeah, so I don't think I don't think anybody would have regrets. You know, we I feel I'm totally blessed to this day. If one person reaches out and said, "Man, I totally love this song on on your new record," it's just you know you get you still get goosebumps. Like, dude, really? You like that? Thank you so much. Totally humbled by the the little following that we have and people hitting us up, you know, and saying, you know, for instance, you personally, man, you know, I want to thank you personally for reaching out to us and, and, you know, while you're doing an, a radio interview, really with me, you know, <laughs> so I'm so appreciative of, of the fact that people, you know, can, can hear a piece of my life on a song or in a song and, and actually touch them in some sort of way, you know. I, I, I even even with my Journey cover band, I feel the same way when people come up to me after the show and go, "Dude, you you brought me back to high school by singing these songs and singing them so well. Thank you so much." And I'm like, "Dude, I'm just I'm singing a Journey song. That's not even my original song, and they don't care. You touched their life in some sort of way, and that's that's a blessing. And maybe that's what I was put on earth for, you know." So it's it's a pretty cool feeling, man. And you, I mean, you know, you've been there. Yep. No, it's funny. I mean, on that note, I mean, for me, Z Lot Z was one of those bands. I mean, I stumbled on you guys through um, Nightmare Records back probably about two thousand. Mm-hmm. Mr. Lance King, thank you so much, Lance. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that was my introduction to uh, like Queensrÿche and all these other bands because I, you know, at the time, you know, like you say, grunge and all that had kind of taken over and you'd hear smatterings of rat or Metallica or whatever, but what well, wasn't, wasn't certainly like it is now. It, it had really died by that point, you know, especially popularly. So I stumbled upon nightmare records and you guys were the first thing that was there. That was Z lot Z. You were like the top of the page or whatever. So I go, well, that's an interesting sounding band. And they had a little sample of the shadow and I go, okay, I like this. This is cool. So I went, you know what? I'm going to take a chance on this record because I was all you have was one, th- you know, a 30 second sample of a tune. And I went, I'll buy that for 10 bucks, ordered it and went, holy crap, this is great. So from there, it grew into me checking out the band and saw, oh, you guys play as a Queensryche tribute band. And all I knew was Silent Lucidity. And I'm like, oh, that's Queensryche. Yeah, not for me. But I'm like, well, th- wait, these guys play as a tribute band. Interesting. So that led me to jump more into Queensryche. And so from there, it just grew. Oh, yeah. We get some of those royalties now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny how that kind of thing grows and where inspiration comes from. No, you know no. what I mean? Because like you say, oh, I can't believe you want to interview me. Well, it's like at the same time, well, I look at how much has come from just discovering, you know, one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And, you know, I mean, I look at how, I mean, wanting to do interviews and this kind of thing grows from that you know, grow some one to hear all these stories and where do these bands come from and how do you, you know, how do you meet up with members mm-hmm. and all the rest of it, right? So. Oh, I think that's in every one of us. I mean, I love watching, watching these, uh, these, you know, archives of different bands. I remember it wasn't too long ago. Um, I sat here and watched the documentary on Leonard Skinner and, you know, I don't consider myself a huge Leonard Skinner fan by any means, but just to, to see their story and, and the tragedy they faced and the interaction between the different members and, and how they looked back on their days in the band and, and all of that. Just there, I guess you have to be a musician to be able to connect with that because like I was getting goosebumps watching this documentary on a band that I really wasn't that big into, but there's part of those dynamics, those relationships that you have with your band members that connection you have with the music, you just, you can't explain it. You just have to have lived it and you, you can just shake your head in agreement and go, man, I totally get where they're coming from on that. We had the same thing in my band, you know? And so it's just that, that weird dynamic and, and uh, you know, you just have to chalk it up to fate and destiny and why you didn't make it and why other bands did. But at the end of the day, if you, if you're, if you were able to touch people's lives, you know, with a song or with a melody, 
then you've accomplished something, exactly. you know? So you alluded this to already, but, you know, you've got the new record and you guys are obviously working on some new stuff. So do you think it likely the new record will happen? Is that kind of what you guys want to do next is push for a third album? That's the plan right now as it sits. I mean, I know um, they have a catalog of songs already written. It's just a matter of, you know, finding that time in life. Like I said, we're all we're all professional career guys. Uh, most of us have families that we're raising. And so trying to keep this, the music thing alive is on the side. Maybe that's why it takes five years to write a record because, you know, there's all these other things in life that take priority, but yeah, that's the goal right now is uh, we have some songs that are already pretty much ready to go. It's a matter of, of tweaking them and, and putting some lyrics and melodies down, seeing how they come out. And if they're inspirational and they come out great, you know, we have the luxury of, of having a, a member in the band with a home studio and we can run over to his house and go, let's lay it down and see how it comes out. Um, obviously we're, you know, we're also going to be looking at some shows, some live shows, you know, hopefully with, you know, with live, uh, I mean, with uh, touring, touring national acts. Um, you know, we had the, we had the fortune of, uh, one of one of the greatest moments of my life in the music industry. You know, I mentioned back in the Z Lot Z days, we we were able to play with icons like you know Ronnie James Dio, and being able to talk to him backstage and share the stage with him is one of the biggest blessings for me ever. Um, Tesla Malmsteen, it's you know I, I remember back in the mid '90s when we opened up for for Dio. I was backstage talking to Ronnie and, and he was 50 years old at the time. And I'm like, dude, how the hell are you doing this, man? I mean, you're, you sounded just like your records of 20 years ago. How, how are you doing it? And he's, you know, it's cliche, but it's, you hear it a million times. Yeah. I'm, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not partying. I'm, I'm getting good sleep. I'm eating right. I'm exercising. It's what you got to do, you know. Back when you're in your 20s, you you feel in, invincible, and you can you can party, you can get three hours of sleep, and go out and play another show the next night and not miss a beat. But as the body ages, man, you can't do that crap anymore if you expect to to keep your chops up. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna be 54 here in a few months, and and I, I consider it a blessing to still be able to sing Steve Perry and 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 do the Echo Temple stuff in the in the vein of of the the Jeff Tates and Bruce Dickinson's of the world, you know, because, you know, even on the, some of the Echo Temple shows, we'll break out a Maiden cover um, or a Symphony X cover or something like that. And, and, you know, so to see those guys still doing it, I mean, I'm getting, I'm looking forward to seeing Maiden here in Houston in September. And I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's going to be, you know, awesome. Like he always is live. So, and I'm sure if you know, Ronnie was still alive, he'd still be, you know, be nailing it like he, like he always did live, you know, um, echo temple actually had shared the stage with Y and T and I was able to talk personally with Dave Medichetti, who I always, you know, admired and loved his voice and to be able to watch them, they're older than us. And that, that night they were spot on and played everything like you had the record on. So, um, we also played with vicious rumors a few years. Nice. And so um, to be able to to be able to share the stage with some national touring acts is going to be very cool. You know, we have a uh, we have a show that we're doing here in Houston with Seven Spires. And really, when uh, when we took that show, you know, a couple of the guys in the band had, had heard of them. And so that's going to be a cool show to be, be able to play with a with a European touring national act. And uh, we hope that the Houston faithful will, will come out in support of those guys, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's tricky too. You know, you never know who's going to come up from one show to the next. And I mean, sometimes too, it's as simple as what night the show happens to be on. It's actually a Sunday, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. Which is even, which is even going to hamper things, you know. So we're going to try to get our, you know, Echo Temple folks out there for that show. And, and uh, it's a tough, like I said, it, the Houston scene is much like, the scene around the rest of the country in the U S it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough thing for melodic metal for, for people in our age group to get out 
and, and, and see live shows. So we're hoping that this will be a good show for, for everybody on the bill. One thing I did want to mention, and I'm glad I remembered it because you would have been uh, upset if I didn't tell you, but one thing in the works right now that I think you'll like to know about is we have a couple of, of different record companies that are in discussion with Eric right now, but within the next probably six months, maybe sooner, there is a label that's going to be putting out what they're titling as Z Lot Z Anthology. And what they're going to do is put every one of our Z Lot Z songs on one CD and re release it titled, you know, Z Lot Z Anthology. And when that comes out, we're going to try to put together uh, another Z Lot Z reunion show in the Houston area. But originally we were in talks with a label and we were hoping it was going to come out around the summertime so that Greg would have time to come down from Missouri, you know, to do the show because he's actually a teacher now, which is very cool, a music teacher. And he obviously off for the summers. So he would have time to come down where we could, you know, do a reunion show. Nobody really knows about it yet because we really haven't finalized any of the legal jargon and all that stuff. But that is in the works. And there was a couple of different ones that we were talking to. So here, hopefully this year sometime, that that anthology CD will be released um, on, on a record label. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> holy cow, we're running up to an hour and a half. <laughs> no, no, man, where did Tom go? Oh, man. But um, no, Tom, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview for certainly the influence over the years and continuing to do what you do. You know, I'm loving the new record and I hope you guys put something else out. Oh yeah. I'm, 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 that's, that's the way we're headed. As long as we don't get, you know, too, too old and too fat, I think we'll, <laughs> we'll still knock them out, man. I'm so appreciative of you, you know, you pitching the band and promoting it and just your, which, you know, doing what you do, supporting this genre of music. That's been such a big part of my life and, the fact that, um, you know, you're you're getting it out to people that may have not ever heard it otherwise, because we're just regular husbands and dads and working for a living guys that have a passion for music. And you getting it out there to bigger masses is, is awesome. And we're so appreciative of what you do. So thank you so much. Of course, yourself as well. I'll get you soon, Tom. I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Hope you have a great weekend, man. Take it easy. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Fear, and I'm a man. Your new birth.